afternoon, everybody. My name is David Lawson. I'm the Assistant General Manager uh, looking after the ag, food and consumer sectors within Austrade. And I also uh, lead the team with the Export Supply Chain Services. I'd like to welcome you today to the fourth in our uh, industry briefings on the Export Supply Chain Services. Uh, I'm hosting you today virtually, uh, but I'm here in Sydney, and I'd like to start off uh, our conversation today just by acknowledging uh, that I am on the land of the um, Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and uh, in the same way as the uh, Indigenous custodians of the land welcomed uh, people to their uh, traditional lands to pass on information. I hope that in the same spirit, no matter where uh, you are, that uh, that you come to this gathering today with the uh, objective of learning uh, and and passing on uh, passing on of information, uh, as uh, the indis indigenous custodians of the land have always done. Um, for anyone on the call who is unfamiliar with our program. The Export Supply Chain Services is an Austrade initiative that was kicked off in August last year by Minister Farrell. Um, and it's a process by which we, we uh, gain insights and, and gather intelligence from conversations with, uh, with industry stakeholders uh, in uh, the supply chain ecosystem. And, and we've been sharing that information through uh, the fortnightly snapshots, and I hope you've all been receiving those. Uh, if you haven't, it's a great opportunity to sign up. Um, and we've also been um, sharing this information through public webinars uh, such as this. Um, most importantly, this is the information that we've gathered has also been really uh, useful in informing the government uh, on uh, how things are faring post-COVID, uh, how uh, the supply chain ecosystem uh, is improving um, and where the bottlenecks are. So um, we're glad that you can join us today for, uh, for this, uh, our latest uh, in the industry uh, insights. Uh, unfortunately, Michael Byrne, our esteemed uh, uh, expert is uh, Unfortunately, unable to make it, but so uh, we are uh, very pleased to be able to uh, uh, have Patrick uh, Orth, who will be joining us and giving us the uh, the deep insights into air and sea freight uh, as uh, as we've um, you know, as we've been able to glean over the last few weeks. Um, for most of you, Patrick is well known uh, on the other end of uh, on the other end of the phone in conversations, and, and it's just a wealth of knowledge. Um, so we're really looking forward to, uh, to Patrick's update. Um, following this, um, you'll see that uh, we also have a special guest speaker, Nicholas Press, who is the CEO and Managing Director of Spectainer. Um, now, this is a spectacular uh, example of a great little initiative. Um, um, Nick, as the, as the founder of this company, uh, uh, innovated with collapsible containers uh, and uh, of course that has um, some really profound uh, ramifications and, and value for, um, for supply chains. So, um, so the collapsicon the, or the collapsical, uh, collapsible shipping container, some of you might have seen it in the media, uh, but we we're really thrilled to be able to, uh, uh, to hear directly from uh, Nick in person about his company. We want to make this, uh, this session interactive as well. So you'll see on the bottom of the screen uh, reference to slido.com. You may already have that app on a phone. Uh, if not, you can log in. Uh, it's free, uh, but it gives you an opportunity to uh, join the conversation. So if there are any questions or comments that you have in relation to anything that you hear today, please feel free to, to engage, raise the questions, and at the end, uh, I'll be uh, hosting a Q&A &A, a Q &A session and we can, uh, we can have a little bit of a, a, a conversation. You also have the opportunity to ask questions of, uh, 
of uh, uh, Nicholas as well uh, regarding spec payment. So um, with that, uh, and without any further ado, I would like to hand over to Patrick, over to you in Perth. Thanks, David. Um, good afternoon, everybody, East Coast, and good morning to those joining us from the West Coast. So, yeah, running you through the points today, and I thought I would just kick off with probably one of the key um, or key points or the key focus shifts that we've seen this year in terms of air freight and sea freight. And it really has been a noticeable shift from the focus on um, clients and that talking about schedules, capacities, um, not being able to get capacity and those types of things last year and, you know, throughout COVID, whereas that really has now shifted um, to rates. Everything, all the conversations that we have, it's all based on rate. When, when are rates going to get better and those types of things? So hopefully my update will give you a bit of an idea on that. Um, but yeah, running through and I'll start with the top with air freight. Thank you, Maxi. So flight numbers as of um, week ending 2nd of April. So we had um, 1,681 flights last week. So that was actually the first first full week of the Northern summer schedules. So the flights did increase actually week on week, 6.6%. Um, so that number, 1,681, represents 85% of pre-COVID numbers. So we did, um, if you saw our latest snapshot last week, we did make that prediction that numbers would get be to between 85 and 90%. So yeah, it'll be very, very interesting, obviously over the coming months watching that number, you know, there's a lot of announcements coming on in the next couple of weeks with starts of flights. There's also announcements in May and also new flights starting in June. So, yeah, we do sort of expect that number to um, to hover around the 85 to 90 percent mark from now right the way through up until the end of October when then we have the change of schedules again. One thing that we, you know, that we have been speaking to quite often in terms of those flight numbers is the the change in the, the makeup of aircraft operating into Australia has changed. So as an example, when we looked at these numbers in February, um, overall narrow body versus wide body, you had 65% um, of flights um, in 2019 were wide body. In February this year, that number had actually dropped down to 60%. So yeah, there, there has been that sort of shift there, but also in terms of the, you know, even the wide bodies that are operating have changed. So instead of seeing a lot of triple sevens and those sort of really good, good passenger aircraft, but also good cargo carrying aircraft, that has dropped away a little bit with the introduction of aircraft like the A350, the 787, while they are good cargo aircraft, um, they don't sort of have that capability of a 777, especially when the passenger figures are really, really high, which is something, um, you know, we've all heard about the revenge travel. So yeah, the, you know, there has been limitations at times in terms of getting capacity on those aircraft. So as you can see on the slide there, in terms of global air freight pricing, um, it continues to come down globally. So, you know, having a look at last week's numbers, pricing was down 32% globally um, compared to the same time period last year. If we were to talk about export freight rates, as you can see on the screen there, they have remained fairly steady over the last 12 months. And, you know, even on some routes, as you can see there with um, North America and the Middle East, um, some of them have actually gone up over the last 12 weeks. So that's really just down to, you know, supply and demand. And especially with the US, that is probably one of those markets that we know uh, that there still remains some challenges in getting freight capacity. Not helped by the fact that we lost um, 17 flights at the start of Northern Summer Scheduling with United Airlines dropping 14 flights and Delta dropping from 10 flights a week down to seven. So that lane, as I mentioned, already has pressure. So the removal of that, which, you know, it could equate to 90 to 100 tonne per week or 300 cubic, um, yeah, it really puts pressure on that lane again. The other one being New Zealand, but what we've heard in the last few weeks, there has been some relief with some new flights starting there. I saw that Emirates restarted some flights, Sydney to Christchurch last week as well. So there is a little bit of relief for New Zealand, but you know that market has always been a pretty hot one. Um, 
So with the freight prices, you know, it, the reason that they remain as high as they are is just the input costs remain really, really high for airlines. So just, um, you know, the biggest input cost for airlines is their fuel, jet fuel. So that takes, well, that, that accounts for 20 to 25% of their overall operating costs. So the jet fuel pricing, while it has dropped down below $100 a barrel, it's getting very, very close to 2019 numbers. Um, the numbers are still very, very high. You know, 2019 was actually a, a quite a high year for, for jet fuel pricing. Um, there is discussions or there is talk that freight the sorry the jet fuel pricing will come down again you know continue to tumble this year but yeah it's all a little bit of the unknown um in that space with you know what's going on and the global volatility at the moment not surprisingly as well with those input costs you know it, it's the extra costs that the airlines are sort of uh, taking in at the moment as well i read a very interesting piece last week about delta airlines and american airlines pilots who will receive a 34 percent pay increase over the next three years and you know that's a huge number right and it's not only that segment you know you're talking about the suppliers to airlines ground handlers and all those things all their costs have gone up and all those costs have flowed onto airlines which you know in the obvious thing which obviously um is keeping air freight pricing higher but also is um keeping your ticket prices higher as well so there's a quite an interesting stat there you can see at the bottom of the slide around the new routes which were operated in 2022 so there were 3580 new routes across the year so a new route is basically something that hadn't operated in the past so across the 377 airlines um, 76 percent of those new routes launched were operated by narrow body aircraft so again it just sort of comes back to you know the changes in the makeup of airlines and what the types of air um aircraft that they're operating across the globe has shifted it was pre-covid there was you know that shift was happening already but now yeah it, it's in full swing so with the improved capability of narrow body aircraft to operate longer distances yeah i think especially for australia and certain ports in australia there'll be a lot of growth in that sort of narrow body market you know you're looking at cairns perth those type of smaller markets yeah i think the growth in international flights for those markets will really come from from narrow body which unfortunately isn't isn't great or helpful for for the freight market on a full passenger load on a narrow body aircraft, you're looking at, you know, either either zero or very, very little cargo uplift. And if there is cargo uplift, it would usually be the likes of mail or um, sort of any other, those sort of express products and things like that. One positive um, that we've sort of been talking to over the last couple of weeks is the increased deliveries expected from from the big manufacturers in 2023 and notably a lot of a big increase in the deliveries of, of wide bodies so Boeing and Airbus um, you know they've had a, a pretty challenging couple of years with like everybody else with supply chain issues and things like that this year they expect to deliver more 787s and A350s than they had done in 2019 and 2018 so that's good for a lot of airlines there's a lot of airlines out there waiting on aircraft. Qantas um, here locally is getting three new 787s this year. Speaking with Air New Zealand, they're, they're waiting on a couple, which I think are either delivered late this year or early next year. So those deliveries, um, you know, for certain airlines, are, they're really holding up that, that growth back into markets they've served previously or, or new markets. So with that, you know, with the new, new aircraft coming on board, we sort of expect... Um, you know, towards the end of this year, next year, there'll be that really a, another big rebuild and another big restarting of certain lanes with um, with the new aircraft being delivered. A lot of the, you know, the airlines obviously took the opportunity to get rid of um, those older, really gas guzzling aircraft during COVID. But with the delays that we've seen, yeah, they just haven't had the, um, the aircraft and at times haven't had the crew to, um, to build those lanes back up. All right. So with that, I will now jump across to the state of sea freight. So as you can see on the screen there, um, we do have the figures for February, but it didn't shift a lot from, from January. So it's remained pretty steady now. 
um, from November, Jan from, from November, December, and January. Um, that is a number that 56 or 52.6 percent there is a global number. So one thing that we do speak of, you know, on our calls is what's sort of happening down in our region. As you can see there, Oceania as a whole is still only at around 36 percent. While it, it is seeing improvements, uh, there's still a long way behind what's happening in the rest of the globe. So sort of speaking to shipping lines down in this region, though, they're, they're starting to see some some really, really good improvements in how they're operating around Australia. a &L, as an example, they were above, for, for their vessels, they were above 70% in January. So those numbers are pretty good. And, you know, 70%. Between 70 and 85 percent is, is a, a good number and comparable to what what was happening pre COVID. What sort of has and continues to drag the numbers down for Oceania is what has happened in New Zealand. So, yes, they had a lot of bad weather earlier this year, which also hasn't helped, but they've had issues sort of across the COVID, the COVID period with too much demand, not, not, not enough staff members and those types of things, which happened across Australian ports as well. Um, what New Zealand is doing, um, it actually was implemented from last week. They're actually, they've reinstated fixed birthing windows. So a fixed birthing window, you know, if you want to think of it in terms of an airline, like an airline slot, you have to arrive on a, on a certain day at a certain time and we'll unload your vessel and we'll load your vessel. So those, so shipping lines are very, you know, are looking forward to that, you know, having that capability and, and that option that if they're going to turn up on time, then they're going to get served in time. The, the vessel will be unloaded and loaded. What it may bring, and it's very hard to judge what's going to happen with this just yet, is with those berthing windows, the, the shipping lines may be restricted in the amount of lifts that they do. So a lift is basically either you know taking a, a container off or putting a container on. So at the moment, they're not restricted in the amount of lifts that they can do, but to help these New Zealand ports sort of keep the, the fixed berthing windows in place, um, shipping lines are likely going to have to agree to a certain amount of lifts per vessel. You know, as an example, it might be 5,000, 2,000 imports, 3,000 exports or something like that. So it's it's a bit of a payoff, but when you speak to the shipping lines, getting that schedule reliability and those types of things back, um, that will be the big improvement and that's going to help them markedly. So it's been... Um, when we have a look at the shipping rates, it's really, you know, there's been a lot in the media of late talking about import rates and how much they have slid into Australia. So year on year, they are down 80% in January. But having a look at, you know, the long term pricing for Australia, the pricing is still 25% higher than it was in February 2020. So it, it's not quite back to where it was in pre-COVID, but um, yeah, it's certainly getting there. And speaking to the shipping lines, a lot of them have said they've basically hit their floor uh, in, in terms of import pricing. Export pricing remains, you know, really, really elevated. It, there continues to be strong demand on the East Coast for, for products like cotton, sort of certain types of grain. And then there's also an increasing amount of demand for meat coming out of the East Coast. There's a little bit of meat coming out of the West Coast as well, but there's just this huge amount of grain demand that has been seen not only last year, but this year as well. So unfortunately that's taking up a lot of, you know, those food quality containers and that extra capacity that would have been used elsewhere in the past. So in terms of, you know, challenges and developments. So we continue to see across the globe, blank sailings and, and canceled sailings. It's it's continually reducing, but that cancellation rate of around nine to 15% is pretty standard across the globe. Australia is seeing, continues to see a lot of canceled and blank sailings. I, um, yeah, I get updates daily from most of the shipping lines and yeah, they're omitting ports and those types of things just so they can get their schedules back on. We expect it to sort of continue happening for the next couple of months. A lot of the shipping lines have started, you know, some new new scheduling out of Australia. So it takes them a little bit of time to sort of get those get those new schedules and those new routings better down. So we expect that to happen uh, across the next couple of months, although it is has reduced a lot compared to COVID. Uh, 
In terms of uh, one of the really interesting things we've seen across recently is the delivery of new vessels. So in the last two months, there's been five different vessels delivered um, all over 24,000 containers plus. So it was quite an interesting four to five weeks where those those vessel or those containers, those vessels were delivered and week on week they became you know, the biggest vessel container in the world. And then the week after they became the vessel, biggest vessel container in the world. So that sort of tells us that, you know, shipping lines are continuing to, um, shipping lines are continuing to invest in the future. Um, but there's still a lot more capacity out there than there is for demand. So the other interesting point you can see there right down the bottom, um, is that sea lead shipping and the launch of a new Australia to an Indian subcontinent service. It's the first one that we've had out of Australia um, in terms of a direct sailing. So as you can see there, that's going to reduce the transit times down to 22 to 30 days, which at the moment, depending on your connections and things like that, it's around 35 to 45 days. The other couple of points I just wanted to touch on very quickly um, in terms of the industrial relations landscape, it's something that we're watching quite closely here in Australia. Obviously, with Switzer and you know that what is happening there is something that not that we have any control, but it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. But also, a couple of the stevedores having EBA negotiations throughout 2023. Uh, I think it's just you know shippers they need to be mindful that we're not we're certainly not out of the woods yet with that type of um, what's that what's happening. You know, have a look at what's happening across the globe in Germany at the moment. You know, Australia is not um, going to get away from that. We just need to be aware and, and ready for something like that to happen. But uh, that is it from me. David, I think I'm throwing back to you. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, always, uh, always interesting. And I see we have a, a, a question on Slido. Um, uh, don't forget, everybody, www.slido.com. And if you uh, register there with ESCS or the Export Supply Chain Solutions, ESCS, um, you can join the conversation and add your question. Uh, and um, uh, we'll be able to get to them at the end. But thanks very much um, for that. I'm, I'm mindful of uh, a comment that Michael made um, Patrick, in one of the earlier um, briefings, and just you, you're talking about the air freight there. I'm mindful of the fact that uh, the Michael once said that um, if you're waiting for a cheaper airfare, book yesterday. Um, so with that in mind, Easter holidays, you know, coming up now, and, and people starting to think about Christmas, it doesn't look like we're going to get any uh, any. Uh, um, salvation on the uh, on the airfare front, so um, that, that's sobering news. But anyway, look, uh, thanks very much for your great insight there, Patrick. Um, I'd now like to introduce uh, Nick um, from Spectane. Now. So, um, in two thousand and eight, Nick was a logistics officer with the Australian Army and uh, realised there was a fundamental problem with how logistics uh, and supply chains functioned, uh, and and. Uh, specifically uh, tweaked to the fact that there are um, um, imbalances just with uh, where containers are, where, they, where they're where they not. Uh, there are cost issues, there are safety issues, empty containers accumulating in the wrong place and uh, you know not where they should be. So we, we call it container imbalance. Uh, and you know we, we talk about that uh, in the export supply chains um, briefing documents, but um, Australian exporters have been particularly susceptible to this, uh, and especially food grade um, containers. So um, there are other um, collapsible containers, um, but Spectainer is ours. It's, uh, it's an Australian uh, uh, invention. It's some great uh, intellectual property and some great ingenuity. And uh, uh, I'd just like to hand over to Nick, who will tell us about how he solved this from a from the container imbalance from a holistic um, um, perspective uh, and build it up to an industrial scale. So uh, while Max is uh, is switching over to uh, Nick's 
presentation so that he can show us a slide. I will, uh, I'm sure it will come up anytime soon. Nick, over to you though. Look forward to hearing from you. Okay, no worries. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Uh, so look, thank you for that very uh, lovely introduction. Uh, as indicated, my name is Nick Press. I'm the founder and CEO of Spectainer. Um, I'm here to share with you a little bit about how Spectainer is evolving the standard container, uh, and it has something to do with automation. Let's see if this keeps going. So I guess while it's a relatively simple invention, uh, the container today now forms essentially the backbone of the entire shipping and logistics industry. Uh, it provides that, that standardization that we need to facilitate world trade. But I think we can all agree that trade looks very different today to how it looked maybe 60 years ago. Um, as trade grew, the industry recognized the need to evolve the container. And we moved from the standard 20 foot to 40 foots and, and other specialist sizes uh, and types for specific cargoes like reefers and flat racks and, and the like. Um, now, all of these advancements have been really positive, but they still haven't addressed one of the industry's core fundamental issues, which is empty containers that result from trade imbalances, countries that are importing and exporting completely different things. Uh, and the, the result of, of that being this, this accumulation of empty containers. Um, and I think everyone in this forum would, would sort of realize during the COVID days uh, of how big that problem really became for countries like Australia. Uh, where we export huge amounts of, of minerals, but not so much in terms of the consumer and, and other type of goods. Um, so what does that really mean? Um, look, empty containers require so many unproductive steps, uh, aside from the fact that they're taking up a lot of space uh, in the ports, on the ships, on road, on rail. Um, an empty container ultimately has the same impact as a fully laden container. Uh, this is where evolving the design can offer some real and lasting benefits. Uh, we can increase the fleet availability, we can reduce bottlenecks, uh, we can improve vessel efficiency, and most importantly, going forward, we can start to reduce CO2 emissions. Uh, so we need to start considering the role collapsible containers can play in tomorrow's sustainable shipping. Now, I'm very much the first to admit that this concept is not new. There's been many types of collapsible containers over many decades. Uh, in fact, we have a few competitors in the market today. But one of the biggest missteps with all these designs and, and other solutions that have come before is that they've been seen as a universal replacement for the standard container. And I can tell you, collapsible containers are not meant to be a standard replacement. The standard box is actually quite efficient on many trade lanes that are balanced. but when we look at the numbers when it comes to imbalanced trade lanes, which Australia is one, um, we're talking about millions of containers movement annually. And that's where collapsible containers can have a really big impact. But as I just said, we're, we're talking a lot of containers on very imbalanced trade lanes, um, approximately 60 million empty movements a year. So any solution from a collapsible perspective has to be able to operate at scale. And this is where Spectainer is pioneering an evolution in the container, not by just the container, but by through a holistic automated solution that's capable of meeting the needs of the industry, not just now, but over the next few decades. And what is our solution? Our holistic solution is designed to operate containers on a global scale. Collapsicon, which is our collapsible shipping container, is the first horizontally collapsible container designed to work in tandem with the world's first automated collapsible, collapsible automation station called the COS, Collapsicon Operating Station, combined with IoT and a suite of support services. So Spectainer, a little bit about Collapsicon as a solution. Spectainer first developed our Collapsicon uh, in 2000. 15 was our very first variant. Uh, however, we're now on generation eight. Um, and it's a 40 foot high cube that achieves a four to one collapsing ratio using no external parts. Uh, so to elaborate on this a little bit further, I'm just gonna touch on a little bit about functionality uh, and the other elements on the screen. 
So firstly, from a functionality point of view, unlike collapsible containers of the past, Collapsicon requires no manual handling. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more when we get into the cause in a second. This ensures that these collapsible containers don't suffer from extended wear and tear caused by operators mishandling or dropping or um, abusing the systems with forklifts and the like. Most importantly, however, it also ensures that the security of the contents can be maintained because any container that can be manually manipulated doesn't ultimately prevent someone from compromising its integrity and getting inside. From a materials point of view, um, while the traditional container is made predominantly of steel and wooden floorboards, I think it's fair to assume that it's not exactly the most environmentally friendly product to produce, particularly at scale. Um, we're looking at this quite seriously. Uh, one of our investors actually is a, a company, well, everyone would know, Blue Scope Steel. Uh, and so what we're actually looking at is how do we optimize both steel in production and also the type of steel we use in time? Now, the current version of the system utilizes off the shelf steel like every other type of container, as well as off the shelf wood paneling. Um, however, one of the things we're investigating is the utilization of green steel going forward. Obviously that technology is still being developed, but it's something that we're very conscious on in our material side going forward. Um, from a manufacturing point of view, we're ultimately changing the very nature of how manufacturing of containers is done. If anyone's gone on YouTube before and seen container production, it's essentially very big uh, assembly line, a bit like a car production facility. Um, but unlike a traditional container, Collapsicon is actually six sub-assemblies. Consists of a floor, a roof, two sidewalls, and two end frames. And what the move to sub-assembly uh, manufacturing means is that we actually can create gener greater efficiency in the manufacturing process because we can actually run parallel production lines where we have sub-assemblies produced more efficiently and then joined together at the end. Um, maintenance is probably one of the biggest ones we get asked a lot about. Uh, obviously, things with moving parts tend to require more maintenance. Um, the fact that Collapsicon is actually six sub-assemblies means that we can relook at how a container is viewed over its lifespan, particularly with regards to maintenance and damage. Um, generally speaking, when you look at a container, uh, when it, the cost to repair outweighs the asset value, the container is generally written off or put into a seconds market. But because we have a six sub-assembly approach, this means that instead of writing the container off, we can actually remove entire sub-assemblies, say a whole wall or a whole floor, and we can replace it with either a new or one that comes from our spares pool. And of course, this would still require us to recertify the container and make sure it's all good for, for use. Um, but what it does mean is that the, it extends the life of the container a lot longer than the current standard container, as well as reduces the environmental impact of producing or at least writing off uh, a lot more containers. And then the last point I'll touch on here from a maturity perspective is, generally speaking, when we think about a container's lifespan, we think it's about somewhere between 12 to 17 years, given how well or badly treated the container is. Um, but again, by replacing this sub, the container sub-assemblies, what we're able to do is actually extend the unit's life well beyond 17 years. And while maintenance is still required, theoretically, the potential to extend the life out to 30 years now becomes a real opportunity. And of course, that means that we can look at less fleet replacement, uh, less production requirements, and, and most importantly, less environmental impact. But as you can see on the screen here, when it comes to utilization in an operational context, it's a 40 foot high cube. It combines four to one, three to one or two to one. It's ISO and industry standard. So it, it meets all the ISO CSC and all the rest of the requirements. Uh, and it's 76.6 cub cubic meters. So you treat it exactly like a normal container for all your goods. Um, but as I said earlier, the container is only one part. So I'd like to now introduce uh, the automation aspect of the holistic solution. So let's just see if my screen works. Yes. Is that playing a video? Or is that just a blank screen? Oh, I can see it. Yep, and it's moving. Okay, perfect. That's what I like to hear. So as I said before, while the, while the container forms the nucleus, uh, understanding the environment in which the container needs to operate is essential. 
we're not talking about a couple of hundred containers. We're talking about a hundred couple of, sorry, a couple of hundred thousand, if not millions of containers. Um, so in the past, collapsible containers have required multiple resources and a fair bit of time to collapse or expand the box. You've had to have multiple people interacting with it, essentially. Uh, and this led to a dilemma in which not only has it been fundamentally unsafe for operators to get in and around these containers as they've been collapsing or expanding, it's also negated any of the savings achieved because the cost uh, to store, transport, manipulate uh, all these containers essentially ate into any of the cost savings you were going to generate. So at Spectator, what we chose to do is deliberately separate the process of collapsing from collapsible essentially is separate the process from the product. And so the idea was to ensure low impact operations, efficiency, and most importantly, operator safety. So we pioneered what you see on the screen being the collapse comp operating station. And as you can see here, what the machine does is essentially allow for the feeding of containers into the machine for it to then be collapsed, combined, and or separated and expand, expanded and separated. Now, this, this machine works two ways, as you're seeing in the video, whereby containers are simply dropped on the system and the system will then take it in and pump out either a single unit or a combined unit. The process, as you see here, is, is either way. In this case, the single container has been placed onto the platform, uh, but vice versa, it works the other way. Let's go back. So what does the COS do? The COS allows us to essentially collapse containers in two minutes or less. Uh, we're working on getting it down, but two minutes is a pretty good start considering the majority of containers today that do collapse take approximately 20 to 30 minutes per container, uh, usually require three to four people, uh, a dedicated forklift or crane, um, and generally speaking, require people to get in Side the container while it's collapsing. And, you know, I'm prob probably speak for everyone here, but I wouldn't be too keen on getting inside a 40 foot bit of steel while it's coming down. Um, so, what that does do is ensure that that operator safety is maintained, as well as maintaining the system and reducing the wear and tear of it because it's a controlled activity. Um, the system is, as I said, fully automated. So, it comes with a degree of sensors, uh, particularly safety sensors, to ensure that it cuts off if people are getting in and around the, the, the system. Uh, but it also is a modular system. Uh, so that entire system you see on the screen actually packs up and fits inside four 40 foot containers. So when we deploy this system, it essentially comes in modules. The modules are unpacked, they're put together, the system is commissioned, and then those four containers are used to run the cycles to make sure it's fully operational and ready to go. Uh, what that also means is that the system can be maintained to a high degree uh, where you don't have an individual element making the machine essentially break down and, uh, and, and stop operations. Every part of it is modular. So if a system part breaks, an entire module will be taken out and repaired and a new module will be put in plug and play. So just continuing on a little bit about data. So collapsible containers offer a solution to the empty challenge. But one of the questions we start to get asked is, you're introducing a lot of complexity. How are we gonna manage now the idea of four containers in one? Um, particularly given that the value of the container lies on these imbalanced trade lanes. So one of the uh, empty container challenge is the geographical and the numerical scale issue. Um, when we think of containers, we look at them as a managed asset. So we decided to track all containers from day one. This allows us to offer the customer the benefit of not only improved visibility, but also improved asset utilization. So we can build those data packs over, the time, over time uh, and work out where the best place to place collapsible containers are, uh, particularly uh, where the best place to combine collapsible containers are. Is it at the depot? Is it at a major distribution hub? Could it be at the terminal? really depends on the specific trade lane and the specific customer. Um, but ultimately what this also does is it prevents containers that are collapsible going off their dedicated train lane, because if they do go off, ultimately they just become a very expensive single container. Um, one of the most important innovations that we have developed is an innovative 
to, uh, management capability to measure CO2 emissions saved per container. Obviously, a single container by itself doesn't do anything. It doesn't create any CO2, but how it's utilized does. Uh, and so what we've developed is a fundamental system in the, in the tracking side that calculates the amount of CO2 saved when these containers are combined. Uh, that gives a breakdown, not just per container, it gives a breakdown by trade lane, by fleet, uh, by customer, a uh, whole range of different data metrics. The other side that these, these devices provide is a data handshake with our collapsing stations. So we can actually provide accurate statistics on how many containers are collapsed, how many containers are combined, how many containers are in a single state, where were they collapsed, when were they collapsed, by who were they collapsed. Um, and most importantly, what that means is for the customer that's paying to collapse them, there is full transparency of each one of those activities. And, you know, one of the other points we, we often get asked about is, okay, the, the technology all makes sense, the data all makes sense, but introducing a new asset class in an industry like this, with the quantity of containers you're talking about, it can become a little bit overwhelming. Um, so to insist the industry and also our customers in, in, in finally integrating collapsible containers, Spectane has come up with a suite of services uh, to ensure that the products both perform effectively and efficiently, and generate those cost and environmental savings. So this is all about collaborating with the customer over the long term so that they can realize the benefits of the solution. It's not about simply just giving a customer a product and saying, all right, there you go, you figure it out. Um, ultimately, it's about assessing the cost and the risk of investing in a new technology and easing that uh, through a simple model. And so we do that through a combined system of customer service, m &R management, online spares, fleet, IoT, our emissions and cost saving calculator, uh, as well as an innovation aspect in which we, we actually work with the customers to understand some of the elements that they want to either improve or new products that they would like to see integrated. And our, uh, our product development pathway looks very strong at this stage. So just to sort of round out a little bit on a value proposition here. What, what does this all mean? Um, so we define savings to be the difference between running a conventional container fleet and a collapsicon fleet. And it has a, a really big impact. So we, we define it by voyage savings, vessel savings, emission savings, and new opportunity savings. So by working with carriers to implement a holistic collapsicon solution tailored to their specific trade lanes, there are many savings and generally the consensus has been, I'll oh, save 75%, four to one. That, that's not correct because introducing a system like this comes with its own costs. And so the savings still are substantial. They, they end up being somewhere between 20 to 60% for a carrier. So let's do a little bit of a case study, uh, a trade lane that I'm sure many on the, uh, on, the, on the call today would be familiar with, Sydney, Shanghai. So from a, from a savings perspective, from a voyage perspective, we, we look at essentially what would the imbalance, uh, sorry, what would the savings be uh, for Sydney to Shanghai, given that you've got about 150,000 TU per month as of 22 uh, statistics, and about 68% of those export containers are empty. So let's say about 102,000 TU. The impact of replacing just 1,000 conventional FEUs with a thousand collapsicons per week and just four of our machines. What does that mean? So for Voyage, we calculate about a 35% saving, which equates to about USD $27 million a year in empty container park, stevedoring and slot costs. From a vessel perspective, we calculate about a 75% saving per, this is again, per 1000 containers. Uh, or about $5.5 million um, from loading and discharging 250 collapsicon bundles versus 1,000 conventional FEUs. From a CO2 point of view, remembering that we're only talking about repositioning 250 collapsicon bundles instead of 1,000 conventional, we can generate about a 37% saving to CO2 emissions, which equates to about 82,300 tonnes per year per 1,000. So based on the introduction of the European trading scheme, uh, sorry, European emissions trading scheme, um, the trading price of carbon as of Jan 20, uh, sorry, as of uh, 
23 is now sitting at 97.5 uh, euros per tonne. So that equates to about another $8.7 million in carbon savings. And then there are also other opportunity savings. And, and so in our modeling, we've looked at future proofing, uh, increasing trade growth container volumes, and in turn, uh, container congestion that results in more and more empty repositioning without the same costs being incurred. Uh, and this ultimately leads to greater fleet utilization, improved vessel sailings, uh, as well as a reduction in future build requirements. Um, so again, this is just a simple case study looking at China, Australia, China, and just replacing a thousand containers uh, with a thousand collapsicons uh, and four causes on a fixed day weekly sailing schedule. But on that basis, collapsicon can deliver a saving gross of about $47.6 million a year uh, or about 54%. So, you know, as a, as a product innovator, it would be expected that my view would be the traditional shipping container is obsolete. We've got to all now move to this technology. The world is going to be fantastic. Um, I would, however, suggest that the 40 foot container still has a lot of life in it. It's still fit for purpose on many, many trade lanes that have a really good trade balance. But for those trade lanes that are significantly imbalanced, like Australia, China, like China, US, uh, like China, EU, for example, collapsible containers offer a much better solution for the industry going forward. And uh, particularly for the exporters who will ultimately gain the benefit of the CO2 reduction and the cost savings. Um, over the past few decades, the industry has looked to evolve the ships, the ports, added a lot of automation, uh, and even the way it operates to meet the new levels of global trade and meet new emissions targets. Um, but for the industry to become more operationally efficient, economically conscious, uh, and environmentally friendly, I believe that the industry must look to newer solutions and embrace this sort of change. Uh, the holistic automated collapse of solution offers the industry the ability to do just that. Thank you. Wow, <laughs> that's amazing. Really impressive. And, and we've got uh, quite a few questions uh, that have come in. Nick, actually, I'll, I'll start with, uh, with a question that came in uh, from uh, Janine from, uh, from Navia Flight, uh, Freight when she actually registered uh, with uh, to, to attend today, she, she actually uh, sent a, a question beforehand. And just to remind everybody, slido.com, hashtag ESCS, if you want to get in on the conversation and see what people are asking. But, but this is what uh, uh, Janine asked. Um, how many companies are out there producing this type of product? Uh, you, you, you touched on others, but how many? And are you seeing any success in any specific country? You. You know, you, you talked about China, you showed us a map of Vietnam. What, where, where, where have you had success so far? Uh, so to address the, the first one about other companies doing this and stuff, um, as I said in my presentation, th this sort of technology is not new and there are other companies doing this sort of thing. Um, there's a company out of Holland, there's a company out of Spain, and there's a company out of the US. Um, I think ultimately, first and foremost, they're all manual systems. Uh, they all require people, they all require locks, clamps, locking blocks, a uh, whole range of different things. Uh, and secondly, none of them have automation. They are all very manual. Um, and additionally, they are all, let's say, different business models. We operate a pure leasing business, uh, whereas they are predominantly build and sell. Um, so it makes it a very different value proposition for the shipping lines. And I think that's probably the, uh, the, the key point of difference between what Spectane is doing with our technology uh, and our solution versus what is out there and what has come before. Um, from, a, from a sort of country perspective, look, the, the shipping lines have experimented with this for a long time. They understand quite clearly where their major imbalanced trade lanes are and where this technology has the most impact. Uh, predominantly, it is production regions to consumption regions. So when we look at that, it's traditionally uh, Asia, specifically China, uh, to countries like the US, to Australia, and to the EU. They form the biggest um, imbalance trade lanes where the technology has the most impact going forward. Mm, interesting. Question from me, um, so it's not on Slido, but uh, who is your, is your business model that you retain ownership or, or is the idea that you get a return from the ownership um, 
through, um, I guess, a major shipping partner? So, so we're, we're a leasing company. Or, I mean, essentially, we are two companies. We're an innovation uh, company and we're a leasing company. Yeah. So what we do is, uh, firstly, we don't do any speculative building. We don't have fleets just sitting there. Uh, we yeah. work very closely with the customer, uh, being traditionally the carriers. But now what we're actually seeing is uh, growth in other sectors. We're seeing growth in mining and logistics who have... Um, heavy containerized uh, utilization rates, particularly for rail. Um, we've seen it a lot in the Middle East and Africa, actually, is, is the new sort of opportunities that we're seeing in those sectors. Um, yeah. But traditionally speaking, uh, it, is, it is carriers uh, and major, let's say, logistic operators operating fleets of sort of 50,000 units plus. Um, those, those customers look at it and then we work with them essentially to develop the value proposition out specific for that trade lane for them, uh, because we understand there's different inputs. The value saving is obviously important that we generate a good return for the, for the, for the carrier, not just from a, a cost, but a CO2 perspective. Uh, and so what we do is we develop the value proposition out. We look at essentially what number of units is going to achieve that on that trade lane. And then we will develop a, a fleet from that as a leased asset. And those are mm-hmm. long-term leases, so they're 10-year leases. And it comes as a holistic package. So they lease the container. Every container comes with a device integrated into it. That's no extra cost um, and no cost for data or tracking or anything like that. Um, the machines are generally leased, however, to depots. Uh, and the depots run the service of actually collapsing and combining the boxes. Um, and again, those are negotiated in the contracts with the, with the carriers so that they always have access to the machines. Uh, and then the maintenance and repair of the machine of the both the containers and the machines are generally done by the depots as part of that service contract. Mm. Um, so Charlie has asked a question about uh, whether um, the containers are capable of carrying wine bladders. I'm, I'm going to s- suggest that um, that's probably a twenty foot container if you're talking about wine because you, of your of your just tonnage limitations. Uh, which kind of ties into my question. You, you're talking about 40 footers. Can you do 20 footers? And and uh, if you can address Charlie's question here about um, uh, carrying um, bladders, specifically wine bladders. Uh, so just with regards to size, currently uh, we have 40 foot high cube. Um, we've gone with 40 foot high cube predominantly because that makes up about 61% of the, the total global fleet. Uh, and, and that's probably growing. Um, The solution, we are working on a 45 and a 54 foot version. Um, The machine itself is is going through a bit of a refinement to allow for different sizes to be placed onto it. Uh, Essentially, the width of the machine sort of changes a little bit. Um, With 20 footers, we have looked at it. We have not developed it as such at this stage. Uh, The technology is capable of doing a 20 footer. Um, however, again, because of our carrier, uh, sorry, because the customer is predominantly the carrier, they're most interested on 40s and above because that's the, the trade lane, say, China to the US. Um, yeah. But again, it's, it's not out of the, uh, the development pathway. It just hasn't been the attention yet. Um, from, in terms of carrying bladders, the, the container you treat like any other container. You, you can yeah. put any type of cargo into it and it'll be treated fine. Brilliant. Um, we've got quite a few questions here. So rapid fire, what's, where's your manufacturing base located? Uh, yep, so we actually developed these systems, the, the prototype versions in Australia, um, actually at Bluescope, which, which was a great sort of adventure down in Wollongong. Um, however, the uh, manufacturing, realistically, we, we've done a little bit of work in Vietnam over the last few years, but we've actually recently just shifted to China. Number of reasons, uh, one, China is 96% of all container manufacturing. Uh, two, the carriers want to be able to pick up the empty boxes straight from the factory. Um, but, but ultimately, we have the ability to develop our manufacturing capability over the next few years based on where sort of trade is going. So as you start to see a tick up in Vietnam and Thailand and those sort of countries uh, starting to produce more, uh, we have the ability to access production facilities in those countries to, to start building in there as well. The right. machines at the moment are built in uh, in Australia, but we're also now building them in China as well, just from a, uh, a speed point of view, to be honest. Yeah, fair enough. Um, can, um, can COS operate alongside traditional containers, or does the vessel have to be one or the other? Uh, sorry, you mean the, the, the Collapsicon or the COS? 
the question says COS, but I think it might be the collapse con. Ah, okay. So, I mean, generally speaking, one of the beauties of this technology is we're creating new efficiencies. Firstly, it can it, it gets treated exactly like a normal container in a single state. And when it's a combined container, it's basically a, a fully laden container. What that means for a vessel, however, is that for the first time, empties can go under the hatches at the bottom of the ship. So traditionally, empties have to go on the top tiers, which means every time the ship goes from port to port, they've got to relocate all those empty containers. Uh, that takes time, that takes cost, that takes, uh, you know, vessels slow down in some cases. They just won't do it because it's mucks with the route, essentially, and the, the times associated. This, however, allows for the first time the empties to place, be placed at the bottom of the ship because they're a fully laden container. So that means that the vessel improves its efficiency, potentially gets out on time a lot quicker, uh, which means it can relate to slow steaming to the next port, but it also removes all that hassle of relocating all the empties throughout the ship. So yes, it operates exactly like a normal container alongside, you don't have to have dedicated vessels for any of this. This is designed exactly like a single normal container or a fully laden container. All right. Deborah Ellis asks, um, do you have difficulties with benefits and costs being incurred by different parties and that's difficult to get a business to, to match the business case? Um, no, great question. Uh, no, to, to the short answer. Um, the reason is that we've been very clear that uh, in our value proposition that this isn't uh, one party in the chain benefiting and everyone else losing. So you would think traditionally, oh, okay, collapsible containers, that's gonna save the carriers a lot of money. Well, that then seems to suggest that the ports and the terminals and the depots and everyone else is gonna lose out of revenue. What we did is we designed a business model that incentivizes everyone along the value chain to save and actually generate revenue. And that's why we actually have this split model where the depots and the terminals are involved and the ports are involved because it's not just about making sure that the carriers can benefit, it's about providing an opportunity for everyone in the, in the whole chain to benefit. Um, so, so that business model, however, is ultimately all these groups are intrinsically linked. You know, the ports and the terminals, they talk to the depots and the depots talk to the shipping lines and all the rest of it. So again, before we roll out, because we don't do any speculative building or any speculative fleet rollouts, all of this is laid out well before a container even touches the water for that carrier. Um, yeah. And so this is where we get the depots and everyone involved and everyone's incentivized before anything even happens. Yeah, very good. A couple of questions about uh, intellectual property protection. I'm going to take a punt seeing uh, time is short that, you've, uh, that you're all over that and you're getting some great advice from Austrade as well. So probably we've helped you on secure that. So I'll ignore those questions. Sorry, folks. Uh, but here's, here's a good one. Are you looking at a reefer style version Anytime soon? <laughs> I, I think um, the, the, the reefers are the unicorns of collapsible containers, I, I would suggest. Uh, we, we have a concept, actually. It, it doesn't achieve four to one. It's a three to one because obviously material and, and things like that is different on a reefer to a standard. Um, it is a lot more complicated um, simply because of the actually to do more with the, the hygiene side. So when the container is reassembled, you have to make sure that it can be cleaned appropriately to take on all the food products and all that sort of stuff. With a normal steel container like, like ours, um, you know, you just get the pressure hose and do a quick inside and you're all good to go. But with a reefer, it's got to be a much higher standard. So conceptually, yes, um, practically, it is on the development pathway, but it's going to take a little while and, and probably a fair bit of cash to to, to yeah. experiment. Well, um, you know, we, we, we wish you luck with that. With, with one minute to go um, and, and a whole host more questions, you know, I'm just sorry we, we can't get to all of those questions. Um, look, um, this has been a really interesting presentation, Nick. Uh, we're, we're, you know, speaking on behalf of everybody, I think, and just some of the energy that we've had from Slido. Uh, more power to you. This is a great story uh, and, you know, great ingenuity, great... Uh, uh, great innovation, and uh, you know it's just great to see um, see this coming out of uh, out of Australia. We wish you all the very best, and and hope that we see a lot of our Australian products using your uh, your containers on uh, on ships and trucks and trains as we uh, you know as as they travel around the world over the years to come. I, I do want to thank you, Pat uh, uh, Patrick Orth, uh, uh, for anyone who joined late, uh, Patrick. Uh, 
filled in at the last minute because Michael wasn't able to make it, but just as a testament to the great work. And, and you are, Patrick, dealing uh, with all of the uh, the people that we're talking to. So you're, you're right across this material and uh, just uh, that, that just showed. There's so many questions that we have of you as well. We've run out of time. Uh, thank you, everybody. We've, uh, we've had a great roll-up today and we look forward to uh, you joining our next one. Uh, if you're not getting... Uh, the snapshots um, from the Export Supply Chain Service, please do register uh, with us and we'll keep you informed every fortnight. Uh, so thank you all uh, for your attendance today and thank you to the presenters as well. Over and out. Bye for now.